Thanks, everybody, for coming. This is a great crowd, and I know we've got a lot more people watching the live stream as well. Um, this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. I um, am a journalist and was at the Washington Post magazine for a long time, and I have this vivid recollection, uh, speaking of technology, when we first got email accounts at the paper and started getting press releases and various things sent to us through our email, which was sort of novel not that long ago. Um, I remember sitting at my desk and getting a email from someone I didn't know, a woman, a deaf woman, who was writing and sending out a query as to whether any reporter might be interested in her situation. She and her female partner were in the process of getting pregnant using a sperm donor from a deaf donor because they were specifically interested in having a deaf child. Uh, both gr were graduates of Gallaudet, are graduates of Gallaudet, and very much part of deaf identity and deaf culture. Um, wonderful women who I actually ended up spending a lot of time with as um, as one of them went through her second pregnancy, they already had a daughter who um, had been conceived the same way, who is deaf. And, uh, and we explored together, obviously, the many uh, bioethical issues um, having to do with uh, their desire. They, were, they desired a baby under any circumstances, but said uh, that it, they felt it would be a particular blessing to have a deaf baby. And they had actually been to a number of sperm banks in the DC area. There are a number of sperm banks in the DC area. And when they asked to, um, if, if they might have a deaf donor, they were told that that was considered a disability and that was exactly the kind of thing, any sort of congenital deafness that would have a donor eliminated from their base. So they, they, they were not able to get a donor through the um, assisted reproduction industry, but uh, sought out a, a colleague, um, a friend who, uh, who would end up knowing the children and being involved in their lives. Um, and, and this, the article ultimately, you know, was extremely controversial. There were many people who had very strong feelings about about their um, their decision, uh, and I just found the the issues so interesting to explore, you know. And what's so interesting, just thinking about technology and its unexpected consequences. Um, well, many people, you know. Uh, thought, well, this is a terrible thing because these moms want to sort of engineer in a disability. But in fact, they were interested in doing what I think many, many parents who use assisted reproduction and particularly use what they call collaborative reproduction, um, a sperm donor, an egg donor, are interested in, which is a child who's like them. You know, a child who looks like you or, or you know, has the same background you do or the same, you know, many people when they seek an egg or a sperm donor really are looking for someone who has their same ethnic background or their same academic background. So a child who they feel that they'll be close to, that they'll have, you know, that kind of relationship with where you understand each other, you can communicate easily, and you sort of come from the same place. So in one sense, it looked like they were doing something different from what many people are doing when they, you know, try to select a donor who has, you know, super aspects. But in, in some ways, what they were doing was was exactly like what I think often uh, family would be parents are doing when they when they select a donor. What's what's interesting and lovely to me is their daughter, um, who uh, their their first child uh, just started at Gallaudet this year, and she follows me on Twitter and I follow her on Twitter. And uh, so you know, family making has progressed and technology has progressed um, to the point where it was just the beginning of email when I heard from them, and now we're tweeting at each other. So um, it's it's uh, been a lovely progression to see. Um, but so I found this issue to be so engaging um, ever since then, because when you think about IVF in particular, I mean, it, IVF was, was created with the idea in mind that it would help women who were under 35, who were married, who had some sort of um, problem with their fallopian tubes. That was the really narrow set of patients who it was anticipated would avail themselves of assisted reproduction. And instead, we've seen just this, you know, explosion in single moms or same-sex parents or, you know, this, this really sort of unanticipated but much larger group of people who want to become parents and are delighted to have, you know, 
a, a technology that will enable them to make a family. Um, uh, there was a lot of attention to when a couple of the companies in Silicon Valley began offering egg freezing to their employees. And again, a controversial question, you know, are, there, are, they, are they making family life easier for their female employees? Or are they actually sort of creating a culture in which women are encouraged to postpone childbearing because it's inconvenient for the companies? Um, so th we like when IVF was first invented, we never envisioned that we would be having these conversations. Um, and and I think that that. It, it continues, you know, the, the conversation continues to progress and continues to be richly um, interesting. A, another aspect, a completely unanticipated aspect of these technologies um, it, that, that I don't think it's been in the news for a while, although it, it sort of creeps into the news in unanticipated ways. Um, you know, way back in 2001, before national security became the, you know, overwhelming concern uh, of Americans, one of the first things that President Bush had to make a decision on was whether to allow federal funding for stem cell research on um, on, on leftover embryos. And, and, and again, frozen embryos are a um, unanticipated consequence of the assisted reproduction revolution. And when I was Further reporting on these issues, one of the most sort of interesting areas to look at were the many, many families who have children as a result of IVF, obviously cherish their children, but also have frozen embryos that they don't know what to do with. So this was an issue for the president, and it got a lot of discussion, but it's also an issue for every individual person or family who... Uh, goes through the IVF process, ends up, as many people do, with frozen embryos and cannot decide afterwards what's the right thing to do with these embryos. So, you know, it used to be that if you were pro-choice or pro-life, that or whatever terms you want to call it, you know, that you were always just talking really about one thing, which was abortion. Um, but I talked to so many individuals who came into the assisted reproduction process thinking, okay, well, I'm on this side of that issue or this side of that issue. But say, even if they thought of themselves as pro-choice, they would look at their children and they would think about these frozen embryos. And they would think, you know, my child was a frozen, em was an embryo, maybe not frozen. And, and, and so what is the right thing to do? And, and, and people would feel parental toward their frozen embryos. They would feel that it was the wrong thing to thaw them. They would, um, I, inter I you know people you know, who went online to try to find people who would adopt their, their frozen embryos. And then one woman who even after she had found one person who adopted and thawed and had a couple of children, there was still some left over. And like she still wanted to be involved, even though she had sort of seeded these embryos to the next person, she still wanted to be involved in what happened to the remaining embryos. But the, and then you have to ask yourself, well, my children will have full siblings being raised in another family. And how do I feel about that? And what does family mean? You know, is it genetic? Uh, is it is it is it not? How important will it be to my children to know that they have full siblings? Like all of these repercussions, I think, are are happening, and they're they're sort of happening on the front pages. And and you know when we talk about personhood amendments, um, I think there there are ways in which the state of frozen embryos is still creeping into the conversation about abortion in ways that may not even be obvious. But um, but. When I when I was writing about this, it was almost ten years ago, and there were half million frozen embryos in storage. There were companies that had um, that had started just to provide storage to people who didn't know what to do, and I can only imagine how many there are now. Um, so anyway, I, I I just think that it's a rich and interesting conversation that gets to the heart of um, of of what families are and, uh, and, and when to have families and what is the nature of our relationships with each other and our children um, that it's really important to keep talking about uh, because lots and lots of people go through this process every day and what I found is they often don't have anybody to talk to about it. So I look forward to the conversations and, um, and, and, and the panelists. Thank you.